Okay, so let's get started today. Got a couple topics. One, finish up talking about JavaScript's object system, which is a prototype instance system rather than a class instance system. So we need to have some words about that. And then we're going to talk about the HTML DOM. And fortunately, we've already covered it somewhat when we covered the XML DOM. But there's different operations that JavaScript provides for manipulating the HTML DOM. So we will be going over that for most of the class today. So if you remember, with objects in JavaScript, you create them and delete them using the same keywords that you use in C++. And you can also create anonymous objects that aren't instances of anything, actually. And they look just like hash tables do in Perl. And the way you access properties in a object is either C++ style with the dot notation or scripting language style as an associative array. Either way works. And unlike instances of objects in C++, you can dynamically add and delete properties from your objects. So I'm going to have a little chart here that kind of makes it shows you what the difference is. So here we have prototype instance. Actually, let's move it over. So um, prototype instance. versus the class instance model used by C++ and Java. So in with instance variables, which remember they are called properties in JavaScript, in a prototype instance model, not just JavaScript, but in any prototype instance model, you may dynamically add and delete. So may dynamically add or delete at runtime. Okay. Whereas in a class instance model, they are fixed at compile time. They're immutable. You cannot change the set of instance variables associated with an object. It is completely determined by its class. That is not true in a prototype instance model. Okay. Also, is it an object at runtime? Okay. Prototype, yes. Prototype object is. Class is not. So a class is a template that's used to stamp out instances of objects. It's like a blueprint. But it's not an object at runtime. I know in Java a class has queryable properties, but technically it's not a mutable object. I'll get to you in a moment, then, okay? So whereas a prototype object is an actual object, and it is mutable. You can add instance variables to it. You can remove instance variables from it. It is a mutable object. You can even change its, the prototype for this prototype object. You could change it from being a rectangle to a circle. So you can even change the inheritance hierarchy at runtime. So these are two big differences between the class instance model and the prototype instance model. Okay, so the class instance model works really well with compiled languages because 
you know at compile time exactly what set of instance variables comprise that object, what set of member functions comprise it, so you, and what the types of those member functions and instance variables are. So you can create at compile time a record to represent an object and you can have fixed offsets for each variable and each function in that object. Whereas in the prototype instance model, you can't. You cannot create a record for it at compile time because you don't know what variables will be in that object. You don't know what their types will be. Wow. And, and you might be dynamically adding or deleting to it at runtime. Okay, so the prototype instance model is a lot more flexible in terms of what you can do with it, but it's also a lot less inefficient. Hence, it's very much in the spirit of scripting languages, which optimize programmer efficiency at the expense of machine efficiency. Demi, now I can. Uh, I was going to say in Python, also in um, Python and Ruby, classes are, and, and also common list, classes are available. Classes are actual objects. Mm -hmm. But in actually, Python is a prototype instance model. It's not a class instance model, despite its... Um, I know how Python syntax is, but technically speaking, Python is a prototype instance model. So that's part of the reason the class is. I don't know about Ruby, but in Python, technically, it's a prototype instance model. So Perl is, PHP is, JavaScript is, Python is. I don't know about Ruby. Okay, just don't know enough about. But you're right. Um, and Lisp, I don't know enough about the object system of Lisp to know whether um, they're objects. Like I said, I know that Java also has objects for classes at runtime, but they're not mutable, meaning you can't change the set of instance variables. Okay. Okay. So those are the big differences. Why did scripting languages go with the prototype instance model? One reason is that you can rapidly make alterations, say, to a graphical interface. If I have a graphical interface and I have a prototype for an object that, say, is a rectangle and Let's say it's a button. Actually, better example. It's a button. And I've prototyped it like that. And I decide, what if it would look better as a rounded rectangle? Okay? I can actually change the prototype from being a rectangle to being a rounded rectangle. And immediately, all instances of this button will turn into rounded rectangles rectangles. So with a prototype instance system, you can sit there with a customer and actually say, do you like this? And if the customer says no, you can change properties on the fly and they will be immediately updated on the interface or any other system that you're working with. And if you change the prototype, that property will be instantly propagated to all of the instances of that prototype. So if I change the color, maybe they don't like the color green. So you change the color in the prototype to blue, and instantly all the instances change to blue. And you might say, well, I could achieve the same thing in a class by making that color a class variable rather than an instance variable. But you typically don't do that. You typically make things like color be a instance variable, and hence there's no way to instantly change all of your instances of a rectangle, say, from green to blue in a class instance system. But in a prototype instance system, since the prototype is an object, since its changes to it are immediately inherited by all instances, 
By changing the prototype, you can immediately update all instances and update your application while it's running. You don't have to shut it down and reboot it. So the prototype instance model gives you incredible flexibility to modify your application dynamically at runtime. And when you're prototyping systems for customers or focus groups or just colleagues, that's a tremendous win. So that's why scripting languages decided to go with the prototype instance model. Okay, so this is an example right here of the prototype instance model at work. I am dynamically adding a new name and a new zip code to that object. When I created the object, it had no properties, and I dynamically added them. And now, with this delete statement, I'm not deleting the object, I'm deleting the name property from that object. So it now no longer has this name property. Okay. In JavaScript, the way you create a new object that is named, that kind, as opposed to an anonymous one, is with a function that has the name of that type of object. So in this case, account is a type of object that we want to create. And you know it's a constructor, both from the name, and then any constructor can access the object through the this pointer. Just like in C++ and Java, you have a predefined this pointer that points to the object. JavaScript also creates a this pointer that points to the object. So when you call account using new, JavaScript is smart enough to create and define a this pointer that points to that object, and then this ends up initializing these three properties to those values. So now I can create instances of an account. Now, at this point, I still don't have a prototype. The function account is not a prototype. It's simply a way to create instances of objects. So it's a constructor, but it is not actually saying what it inherits from. Sometimes you want to create an inheritance hierarchy. Okay, nothing here in account says what I might be inheriting from i.e. what my superclass is. Okay, so in a prototype instance model, the way that you do it, well at least in JavaScript, is you have a property called prototype. And you assign to that property, if you want it to have a, in effect, superclass, you assign it an instance of an object. So that's why I said a prototype is actually an object itself. Okay, so this is saying at this point that B's superclass is C, in effect. But it's not really a class instance system. It's actually saying B's prototype is C. Okay, so you can now see that if I create an instance of B1, it will create a width property but no height. Yet if I say alert B1.height, it prints 25 because I created this C object and so what I have here is B. Okay, it's not going to work so we'll do it over here. So here's B, and it has width, and it also has prototype. And prototype is pointing to this instance of C, and that instance of C has a height of 25. Now I could go ahead and in this instance of B create its own height, in which case it would assume whatever height I assigned it, which is 40. Okay, so I'm allowed, let's see, what did I call it? It was B1. So I could say B1.height 
equals 40, and now its height is 40. I could then delete b1.height, and it would delete it from here, but now if I, it would actually still have a height, it would get it from c, and that height would now be 25. Okay, so this is different than a class instance model. Okay? So C is an actual object. And you could have another C that was a prototype for another type of object A. And again, it would point, could either point, you could have it point to that object, or if you want it, you could make it instead point to the same object that B points to. So it's very flexible, this prototype instance model. Even when you have two different types, A and B, with C as a prototype, you're allowed for each of them to have a different instance of C as their prototype. So you could actually customize each version of C, and you would have different prototypes for A and B, even though technically C is the prototype for both A and B. Okay, so while I say that you can add and delete instance variables, adding an instance variable actually has the effect of masking the value of the same instance variable in the prototype. Deleting the instance variable removes the mask, and in fact, the value in the prototype will still be retrievable. Now, if that value wasn't in the prototype, it would actually be undefined. So questions about that. Okay, so you can dynamically, as you can see here, I dynamically created the prototype for B, and I could change it if I wanted. I could change its prototype to be D. That's how I could go from a rectangle to a rounded rectangle if I wanted. I would simply change the prototype to point to a rounded rectangle. Okay, so questions about these, how you create inheritance chains or about this prototype instance model? Yes, Jaja. Ja. Yep, you can name the properties whatever you want. Now, sometimes it might be the case that you're going to pass it to a function that expects the properties to have certain names, but there's no um, limit on what you can name them. Okay. Subject to, they have to follow the naming conventions for C-style variables. Other questions? Okay. So... Now, how does this prototype instance model, okay, actually I'll tie it in, in later. So let's now change and talk about the HTML DOM. So you'll remember the way I said that you change a, obj or a web page using JavaScript is to modify something called the HTML DOM, which stands again for document object model. So this stands for document DOM. Equals document object model. So every web page, so every HTML page is parsed into a DOM object. Okay, and a JavaScript. I'm going to start abbreviating JavaScript JS so I don't have to write it out all the time. So a JavaScript program or script can access it, this object, via the variable document. So all browsers 
agree on this, they will create a variable called document that points to this document object model. And HTML is like XML. It can be parsed into a tree based on the tags, with the leafs being the content that is displayed on the web page. And JavaScript gives you tools for modifying the web page. So in fact, I'm going to start out with an example to show what's going on. So I'm going to assume, so let's go actually to the page. Uh, what did I call it though? Okay, hopefully you can read this in the back. Huh, something's haywire here. Really haywire. Let's do it again. Right now, the projector doesn't seem to be playing well with my uh, monitor. OK, so I have an HTML document. Let's first look at what it currently has. It has a div, which stands for a division unit. It has two paragraphs saying this is a paragraph, this is another paragraph, and then the end of the div. And if I display that, you'll see it display like this. And then you'll see there's a button at the bottom called Add. So if we go back and look at my thing, I also at the bottom have input, type equals button, value equals add, on click equals add paragraph. So it's going to call a JavaScript function called add paragraph. So let's see what the add button does. You can see it added a new sentence. This is new. Okay. So it updated the web page. So what happened is that I had this script up in the head section called add, and it defined a function called add paragraph. And you'll see it access the document variable. And one of the things that is provided by these document variables are methods that allow you to create and delete new HTML elements. In this case, I am creating a p tag. And so that gives me an object, an actual object, and it returns a reference to it. So like Java, JavaScript is using references, which you can't physically get your hands on, but para is now a reference to a paragraph object. Now there's this property called inner HTML that allows me to change the content of that paragraph, and so I'm assigning it the content, this is new. Now I have this tag, but it's not yet been linked into the HTML document. So the next thing I need to do is link it into the HTML document. And in order to do that, I need to have a pointer. I need to know where I want to link it in. So in this case, I want to add it to the end of the div1 section. So to do that, I get a pointer to div1 via this get element by ID. So what does get element by ID do? If we go down here, you can see that I've been naming these tag elements using this ID attribute. The ID is meant to be a unique name for each attribute. You're not supposed to ever duplicate it, even across different tags. So it wouldn't be right for me to name even a p tag div1. This is supposed to be unique for the entire file. 
It's like a key that's able to retrieve the node associated with that tag. So this get element by ID is effectively using that key that I defined for the tag to get a pointer to it. So you can think of it almost like a hash table. Okay, it's not quite that, but this is an effective query of our tree. So it returns a pointer to it, and now the append child command is adding it as the last child to this div. So the div was already looking like it was div1 went to p1 and p2. So I'm adding this new paragraph element right there with a pen child. And then when I update the display, that's what I get. It now appears in my document. So I've actually used this little JavaScript script to modify the HTML DOM for this particular page. And when the script is finished running, it actually, the browser automatically updates the page by traversing this document's parse tree, or yeah, it's HTML parse tree, and it reconstructs the page. Okay, I could have put this somewhere else. I could have said, for example, get element by ID P1, and now I could say replace child, element with para. I'll reload this. Now when I change it, it should this is a paragraph should go away. It didn't probably because I have it in the wrong order. Nope. Okay, in this case, we go to our web handy dandy tools. So we go, to, why is this doing that? I hate smartphones. They constantly, just without your permission, go from being silenced to making noise. And I have no idea sometimes why they manage it. Okay. So we go to our web console. And we see it says node was not found at para.html9. Okay, so I have a problem at line 9. So element.replaceChild. And the issue is that a para is not a thing that I can add stuff to. Okay, it's actually a div that I'm supposed to be replacing the child in. So it's not happy about this. So I need to go back and actually get a div element. And I actually need to say div.replaceChild, and now I'm going to also make sure that I have the right version for replace child. Yep, para o child, okay. So this should be right now. We have the element, we have the div, we're replacing this child, so let's reload that and run it. Still no good. Type error. Div is null. Pardon? Ah, div1. Thank you. So good to have a whole bunch of eyes. So we reload. There we go. And you went from, we'll do it again. This is a paragraph right there. I'll highlight it because it's going to change to this is new. Okay, so you're able to use these commands with the DOM to modify your document. Okay? So now let's look at some of the what we have available to us. 
So remember I said there were various ways to retrieve pointers to nodes in that HTML parse tree. So get element by ID is probably the favorite. You need to have an ID equal attribute for that tag and that will return a pointer to it. You're also allowed to refer to items by using a class, which is a more expansive set than an ID. So a class could actually be something like a paragraph, or it could be, for example, the set of all paragraphs that start a division. You might want the paragraph that starts a division to be bold-faced, or you might want it to be um, indented. So you can also have associated with tags a class thing, like say first para. And by itself, this isn't really that helpful, but it turns out that you can use this class name in things like cascading style sheets to style something. So in a cascading style sheet, you could have something like say p dot first para. And you might have, for example, I can't remember what it is. It might be font type, bold. And that would mean that all paragraphs whose class was first para would now have a font type of bold, whereas all other paragraphs would show up in the default font type for the document. So using that, you can get a list, get elements by class name, will return a node list of all of the elements with that particular class or yes, class name. And now you could go through them and for example, you might modify their style attribute to do something with it. We'll get to the style attribute in a moment or you might do something else with it. There's also a property called forms, which is effectively an array. It's an object, actually, because remember, associative arrays in JavaScript are objects. But it's an object that basically just has a list of key value pairs. The key is the name of the form, because you can have multiple names for forms. And then the value is a pointer to the node for that form object. Okay. And finally, you can get elements by tag name. So this will return all elements with that tag. So now we're getting all paragraphs in our particular document. And here you can see me then iterating through it. It's essentially a uh, array that I'm able to, so the node list is essentially like an array, and I, in this case, am retrieving the paragraph's contents, which I get through the inner HTML property. So the inner HTML is, eh, give me, okay, so again, so I was saying inner HTML, okay, this property stores the text content for the node, if it has any. So some nodes like paragraphs are really meant to be, that's not actually true. Paragraphs can have nested elements like bold-faced elements in them as well so but they have structure to it and in any event you can get access to the inner HTML of a property um, you can get access to the text content through that inner HTML um, string okay so this is the four ways that you kind of can get access to elements element by ID by class name, through a form, array table, or by tag name. 
So they do have a number of other predefined arrays too. So they have them for forms. Sometimes you want to get access to images. That's actually fairly common. If you want to do animations, you typically are going to need to change um, what the image is, point to a different image file. They also have an array to your anchors. And in case you don't know, the A tag in an HTML document stands for anchor. Even though we always call them links, it's kind of unfortunate because there actually is a link tag. So the anchors actually are the URLs that are specified in the anchor tags. Actually, it's a pointer to those anchor tags. I shouldn't have said the URLs. It's a pointer to those anchor tags. And then the document links are pointers to resources. So at the top of a file, you can do things like you may have a link tag, and you might have something like source, of course, if I could get it right, equals, say, foo.css. There'd also be a type that indicated that it was a style sheet. So, in fact, the link tag is in the head statement, and this should give you a list of the tags associated with your resources that you brought into your HTML document. So don't get confused. There is a difference between anchors and links. Okay, L Anchors are the URLs that you jump to. Links are actually meant to be resources like CSS style pages or style sheets. Okay, so then obviously we want to typically do something with the object once we had it. So these were ways to get to particular nodes. Now we probably want to change them. What we probably do not want to do is use this. So writing, remember, is a sledgehammer. It actually destroys the entire HTML document. The only time you're supposed to use the write is when you are loading the HTML page and you want to add some dynamic content to it as you import it or as you're building it. Once it's loaded, you should not be using the write command because as I said, it will wipe out the entire page and replace it with whatever text you write. So it essentially will be body, text, and that's it. You'll have a something that looks like body goes to whatever the text is. That will be your new DOM object, which is pretty worthless. So typically that's not how you do it. One way you do it is you modify the elements in our HTML. So for example, the way you would update a stock quote is you would change the inner HTML to the new value for the stock quote. Or with an image, the way you get those animations, like the amazing dancing figures, is by changing their source attribute to be an appropriate new image. So you might have a clock that every so often triggers a function, a JScript function, which changes the source attribute of that image to be a new JPEG. So that's how you get those animations. Or one thing that you commonly want to do is change one of the style attributes. So every object has a style object, which is accessed via the style property. And you can change any of its style properties. So for example, I might want to change the color to be blue. So let's actually do that. So here, my para.html, not only will I make the, instead of doing my replacement, 
I'll do a pen child again. And I'm going to turn element to be color to be red. I'll make it blue. Okay, and if I load that page now, and hit it, you see that the paragraph turned blue. So that's the way, one thing you frequently are going to do is you're going to be changing attributes of objects. Another common thing is that you're going to enable or disable form elements. So oftentimes you have some form element disabled until you are ready all information has been entered and now you want to enable it. Or maybe you're printing a page. Remember when you print, here I get pages, here I have from something to something. I really don't want to be able to edit these pages until I select from. So in a document I might have disabled these two text boxes and only when I click from would I want these two text boxes to be enabled. So that would allow me this attribute right here is what controls whether form widgets are enabled or disabled. When they're disabled, they're unable to take input. They won't respond to events. Okay, so three ways that you would typically change content. Change the inner HTML, change an attribute, or change the style of a particular element. Okay, you can also change the structure of an HTML document, which is what I showed you at the beginning. So you can create a new element and you can remove a child that won't actually destroy it. I believe JavaScript uses garbage collection. So it doesn't actually destroy it, but it does remove it from the document. You can, as you can see here, you can insert before, so that allows you to insert anywhere before something, and append will obviously add it to the end of that particular element. So that requires, both requires parents, this will replace something. So these are the five commands that allow you to modify the structure of an HTML DOM document. Okay, so questions about that. So now you know how to query the nodes and get a pointer to one. You know how to change content. and You know how to change structure. Okay, that's all well and good, but you have to have a way of getting these functions called. Right now, I haven't yet told you how to get these functions called. The way we do that is with events. So when the user does events, for example, when they click on this add button, it fires an event. Okay, in this case, that event is, whoops, the event is on click. So these are a series of predefined events. We'll actually get into them next Tuesday. But what you can do is you can associate events with snippets of Java code, JavaScript code. Okay, so in this case, on click, I'm calling the add paragraph. Okay, now, this is one way to do it, which is to put it into the actual source code. That's generally frowned on because it allows anyone, again, to look at your implementation. Generally, it's considered better to associate these functions with your code as you load the page. So you're actually supposed to have scripts that when the page is being loaded, 
it actually gets the particular element and assigns the function to the onClick property. So this is changing an attribute, in this case, so events. So events have property names, and you can associate functions with them. So this is generally the preferred way to do it, rather than embedding or hard coding the function into the page source. Okay. So this would typically be in some .js file, and in your head you would import this .js file. So in your head document you would import this .js file, and it would execute, and it would add these elements to the appropriate pieces of your HTML document. Okay, and you don't embed those in a function. It's just like in PHP, you just have a list of these commands, and they will execute when the JavaScript file is loaded. Okay. And finally, I have this thing on navigating the DOM. I've never really used these because I typically use get element by ID or I go to the form, but you actually do have a bunch of, these are linked, so this property parent node will allow you to traverse to your parent. You can get any child through the child nodes array. You can get the first child or last child of an element through those. You can get your next sibling or your previous sibling. If you want the body element, which is the root for the content of your document, that will give it to you. And document element gives you access to the root of the entire document, which includes the head element. So basically, your document element is pointing to your head and your body elements. Okay, But as I said, I don't typically need to use these when I do navigation. I find it easier to get at nodes through their ID properties. That's almost always the way you want to do it. So you almost always tag your elements with ID attributes and then get at them that way. Okay, and again, you should know this. I keep hitting on it. The way you modify content is with inner HTML. Technically, this is not in the W3 standard, but all browsers support this property. Technically, you're supposed to do it like you would in the PHP DOM parser, which is you're actually supposed to access the first child of the node, which if it's a leaf node, is simply its text node, and change its node value to be the new text. That's the formal, correct way to do it according to the W3 standard. But, as I said, all browsers support the inner HTML as a shortcut. Yes, Demi? HTML has been standardized as Okay, so does that mean it now, as of HTML5, inner HTML is a yes. formal? Perfect. I'll change my notes. Okay, so subject to my verifying, it appears that in HTML5 it was formally codified as a property that you could use. Okay, and then we already went over how you modify things, so you can play with it. By the way, very useful thing, but don't do it here in class because W3 schools will think you're spamming them. I know this because I once tried to have everyone do it. Is that if you go to W3 schools, and let's find the HTML DOM.
or let's go to my notes and find it. There we go. So, come on. I thought I had... Okay, there we go. They have these things called try it yourself. And you can actually go there and with the try it yourself stuff, you can just play with things and see how your document would look. So here, click me, click the button to change the layout of this paragraph so you can see the uh, my function is changing, is saying document.get element by ID demo. It's changing the font size to 25 and it's changing the color to red. So this paragraph, when I click the button, is going to go to 25 font pixels and red. So when you're doing your homework assignments and you want to debug your code, I found going to W3 schools is a really nice way of debugging, going to one of their try it blocks, just any try it block actually works, and you can put your code in there and try to debug it there. So this is actually my preferred way of debugging in JavaScript, just go through W3 schools and go to their try it window. Okay, so any questions about this? Okay, so last thing. Tying together the prototype instance model with the um, with this DOM. So remember, I said the nice thing about a prototype instance model is it allows you to easily change a graphical interface. Well, that's why JavaScript has the prototype instance model because the DOM, the HTML DOM, controls the graphical interface and by changing properties, like here I was able to override for a particular paragraph, I overrode the attributes just for that one paragraph, and maybe it's just temporary. So I temporarily setting it to red and 25 point. If I now deleted it, which I could do, it would go back to whatever the style element was for its parent. And in this case, it would go back to being black in whatever font it was before. So I'm able to easily temporarily override things by adding new properties to an object. And then I can delete them, and they'll get the properties re-inherited from their prototype, and they'll revert back to their original form. Perfect for what I want to do with my web pages. So the prototype model, and you can easily add new elements to your document. So the ability to add or delete things, which is a characteristic of the prototype instance model, is perfect. So you're just given a document object, and now you can add and delete anything you want from it. So the prototype model works very well with JavaScript's um, intention of modifying the graphical user interface. Okay, so I'm going to let you go. I know this is a short one, but on Tuesday we're going to go over forms, form validation, regular expressions, and how you associate events, what kind of events you have to deal with in HTML. Okay, so it has a predefined set of events that you can use to associate with JavaScript functions.